important to become a center of excellence in the human health and potential domain within Singapore. Our institute has launched the SICS Seminars Human Potentials a series, which is a monthly webinar that aims to foster exchange among professionals in the human potential space build a network of like-minded individuals within the scientific community and explore potential collaborations to further research in the human potential space. So today our esteemed speaker is Professor Sir Peter Gluckman. He trained as a pediatrician and biomedical scientist and holds a distinguished university professorship at the Liggins Institute of the University of Auckland. He's also Chief Scientific Officer at SICS and holds honorary chairs in the University College London, University of Southampton and National Uni University of Singapore. He has published over 700 scientific papers in perinatal and developmental physiology, neuroscience and endocrinology, evo evolutionary biology and medicine, and has authored both technical and popular science books. Um, he's also president of the International Science Council and has received the highest scientific and civilian honours in New Zealand and numerous scientific awards such as Singapore's prestigious uh, uh, President Science and Technology Medal last year. So today, uh, Sir Peter will look at the epi epidemiological and experimental basis of the um, developmental origins of health and disease, otherwise as known as DOHA, and how despite being well established, its application to public health policy has been extraordinarily limited. He will discuss the reasons for this as it informs much about both the practice of science and evidence to policy and political nexus. He will share about the Gusto, Espresso and MEM studies and how they are designed to reduce these barriers and why the challenge of context-specific, scalable and appropriate remedies still remain. So without further ado, I'll hand this time over to Sir Peter. Uh, for those of you who um, I'm presenting, please kindly mute yourselves. Uh, Sir Peter, over to you. Well, thanks very much. Um... I'm going to slightly change the arguments as this talk goes on. What I want to do is use the work that's been done on Doha to explore how can uh, science of the type that is done in SICS actually impact on public policy. And I'm going to do so in a very generic way, not talking particularly about the Singapore situation, but to think more generally. And, and so the question I ask is, the science of Doe had started really emerging well, well before, but particularly from 1988, and has over the last 34 years been amply demonstrated. Yet with narrow exceptions, and that exception might include Singapore, it's had very little impact on public policy. And the question is why? And how does that, what does that teach us about the relationship between science and public policy making? There's actually a long history of scientists suggesting that conditions of fetal life and early life uh, 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 impact on later disease. I grew up in, the in science in the 1960s and 70s, particularly the 1970s. And in the 1970s, there was beginning to be a lot of data, particularly experimental, but also epidemiological, shown that, that there was something relating between an, the conditions of fetal life, whether they be type 2 uh, gestational diabetes or fetal growth retardation, and long-term consequences for the health of the organism. And perhaps the most dramatic study was that of Ravelli, who's studying the survivors of the Dutch famine, uh, which had occurred in the Second World War, showed that the adult offspring had particular risk of diabetes, uh, of obesity. But it was in 1988 when David Barker reported this inverse relationship in birth weight and lifetime risk of hypertension type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome based on a study of 70-year-olds uh, where they had birth records on them, that things started to change. And you can see the general, what, for people who were born in the 90, in, around the First World War, there was generally an inverse relationship between birth size and the risk of getting the metabolic disease in adulthood. There was a hint at that time of a U-shaped curve, 
And more recently, that has been well uh, demonstrated. For instance, both in the United States and in India, there's now a clear U-shaped curve of the conditions of fetal life and, uh, and later risks of type 2 diabetes. Barker's observations spurred a lot of work, including most, much of mine and Johan Eriksson, who's now the ED of six, and many others. And over the 1990s and the years to 2000, there was an immense amount of work trying to understand and demonstrate the universality of the relationships between the conditions of early life, particularly before birth and after birth. And in 2011, I, I, th there was a declaration by the United Nations General Assembly, one that I happened to write, but we won't go into those details, uh, which was the only time the United Nations had a General Assembly specifically related to non-communicable disease, which reported that maternal and child health is inextricably linked to the later development of these diseases and their risk factors such as low birth weight, and pregnancy and gestational diabetes are associated with risks in both mother and the offspring. The only significant response to that rather than was, in fact, the WHO had set up a commission which I co-chaired on ending childhood obesity. But in fact, the work of that commission, and despite the fact it was approved and an action plan was developed by the World Health Assembly, has generally led to very little impact on public policy making in, in the actual countries where it matters. And so the question is, why was there such a delay in recognition? And a delay that almost that continues in many countries beyond paying lip service. First of all, there's been an unfortunate habit in our community to think it's all about the Barker hypothesis, namely the relationship between low birth weight and the risks of type 2 diabetes, when in fact, there's many that birth weight is actually largely, largely not core to the story. And as I showed you with the U shaped curves, it's clearly obvious that there's more than one pathway involved. There's been a confusion between disease risk and causation. What happens in early life doesn't cause disease, but it appears to change the risk of getting disease later in life. For much of that time, there hasn't been agreement on a conceptual framework and a lack of plausible biological mechanism, and no real evidence as to its relative importance compared to trying to alter lifestyle in adults. And the lack of compelling interventional evidence remains the core issue of the day. And hence, and these points all point to the kind why uh, SICS is moving in the directions that it is. But there was also policy skepticism. Much of the discussion about uh, non-communicable disease, particularly obesity and diabetes and heart disease, has, particularly in the neoliberal phase of the last 20 years, been largely driven by, well, that's individuals' responsibility to choose what they choose to eat and how they exercise. Not recognizing the compelling evidence, some of it from SICS, that of course it's actually it's not a matter of choice, it's a matter of biology. Some people have a biology preset, so their choices, their, their ability to make those choices is virtually impossible. More importantly, I and, and equally importantly, is the fact that if you're going to try and pretend you're going to do something in early life, particularly in the perinatal and pre natal period, to affect disease risk that's going to occur 30 or 40 years later, you're most unlikely to get a positive policy response, given that's well beyond the lifetime of politicians in any type of jurisdiction. There's also been a lot of medical and expert skepticism purely because there is no, because of those issues of an intellectual framework, a mechanistic framework, and relative to the large amount invested in treating adult diabetes and type and, and heart disease, uh, there's a lot of vested interests in not focusing on the child or the fetus. And of course, the fundamental issue remains what to do about it. It's all very well to say the conditions of early life matter, but what are you going to do about it? 
And so before I answer those questions, I want to take a quick journey through my other life. That's the life between how evidence and policy come together. And the point I'm going to make are generic. They do not relate specifically to Singapore or to any other government or to any specific question. First of all, providing policymakers and politicians simply with the factual results of scientific experiments will not, on its own, lead to policy choices and policy decisions. Policy making is a much more complicated than just accepting the word of a scientist. Remember that policy making always has mixed objectives. It's impacted by external externalities. Uh, it's impacted by political and societal values. And it's always about making a choice. There's always a choice to do different things. There's always an option to do nothing. So there's always two options, do something, do nothing, and then there's options between what that something is, which affect different stakeholders in different ways with different consequences. And many of them are not certain. Policy makers are actually, in general, far better at handling uncertainty than we give them credit for. But particularly in most countries, particularly in democratic countries, the choices that policy makers are made are impacted by which groups of their stakeholders are more likely to be positively or negatively impacted. And all policy making contains complexity, risk and uncertainty. So what else other than evidence matters in public policy making? Policy making always involves trade-offs and seeking a solution to the range of inputs. And these are the other things that always come into policy making. And most of them are very values laden, the community values, vested interests, public opinion, cost benefit, magnitude of the effect, competing considerations, diplomatic considerations, and in democracies, political ideology and electoral considerations. Textbooks will tell you that policy making is simple. I'm not going to go into the slide, but textbooks will say, will imagine it's a linear process between awareness raising, problem definition, identification of the options and so forth, when in fact, as I tried to point out in this awful PowerPoint, it's in fact much more complicated and often it's quite amorphous how an executive government comes to make a particular decision. One of the other problems is policymakers and scientists often think differently. Often when I find when policymakers and scientists talk to each other, the question the policy maker wants answered is not the same as the question in the mind of the academic. And I think it's really important when you're engaging with the policy maker that there's a sort of a negotiation to identify what really is the policy maker wanting to achieve and how can science do that. And one needs to be aware of that in the interaction. One of the things which I tell the scientific community globally is, don't write a report and unasked and expect it's going to be acted on. If you're going to write a report or a policy brief or anything else, one wants to have a customer, if you like, the customer being the policy maker in the political community that want to receive the information. And understanding that and building those relationships and getting closer to the policy community, the relevant ministries, the relevant advisors is key. Because if you do that and pre-prepare them, when you go through the effort of synthesizing the evidence, transmitting it appropriately to the, to the policy community, it's more likely to be heard. The other thing is you need to be prepared. Policy making is always being confronted by externalities. At the moment, for example, policy makers are totally confronted by the multitude spillover effects of the atrocities happening in Ukraine. And so they lurch to problems when they arise. And if something happens in the media that calls attention to an issue, they're more likely and often wanting to see about it. And so one needs to be prepared and take advantage when it occurs. The other thing to remember, and it's important when we're dealing with public health and issues like that, 
that there are multiple stakeholders to think about, ranging from those who are affected to potentially to other parts of the medical and policy space, to the education space, to the, to the private sector and so forth. And it's useful before you start to prepare a report or advice to a government or a policy community to think through who's going to be impacted by whatever you advise and who's got the most influence. And it's particularly those who are going to be heavily impacted and those who, who, who have real influence that's important. Unfortunately, in the case of children, while they're heavily impacted, can be heavily impacted, and their consequences must be brought to bear, their potential to have influence is often very weak. And again, one needs to think about the alliances you need to have to build it through. The other thing that I think too often gets forgotten is that policymakers don't look at it through the lens of molecular biology or the lens of physics or the lens of mathematics or the lens of, of sociology. They look at everything in a multidimensional way. And therefore, it's really important to have the right arguments and the right domains brought together when you provide advice. The other problem thing that I think the science community forgets time and time again is policymakers don't want to be told there's a problem. They want to be told there's a solution. And a problem definition alone will not change policy. What they want and deserve and need is solutions which are practical, affordable, politically and policy acceptable, and where appropriate, scalable. And that is the challenge that DOHAD brings. What are the practical, affordable, policy acceptable and scalable solutions to address the issue? Whenever you go to the policy community, these questions are always there, even if they don't ask them overtly. Why do we have to do it now? Why is it a priority? Can't we leave it to another time? Have we got an option that will meet our broader needs? Who will it benefit? Does it benefit our key stakeholders? What are the risks? What's the risk of doing something or not doing something? And most important of all, what will it cost? So my point in all of this is to point out that just because the Dohead community had a lot of evidence, it didn't mean the policy community was going to act. Now, I won't dwell on this slide because I think it's pretty self-evident that there's a lot of cultural things to think about in the interplay between science and policy. A policy, a scientist who doesn't understand the policy process is unlikely to have impact. You need to understand that you've got biases, the policymakers have bias. You mustn't approach them with, uh, with arrogance and you must recognize that they understand the values of dimensions more than you do. You need to decide whether you're being an issues advocate, that is, you're going in there with a particular solution in mind, or you're going in there as an honest broker, pointing out what the issues are and what the options are for addressing it. The latter always is better because it gives the policymaker options and allows them to find to feel that they're actually contributing properly to the solution. So what, going back to Dohad with that background, what do we know about developmental organisms? Well, we now have conceptual frameworks that I'll go through in the curriculum moment. We now have putative mechanisms involving epigenetic and other mechanisms. We have very good evidence that, that early life impacts have impacts on longevity, on cardiometabolic disease, an allergic and related outcomes, and increasingly evidence about neurobehavioral outcomes and, and, and so forth. We now know, as in fact the epidemiology showed, that there are different, at least two different pathways. There's a pathway which involves what I call evolutionary mismatch, and a pathway which was through what I call developmental mismatch. And so what we're dealing with is a situation where at the, on the other side, the adult community is saying, well, you, you don't have any evidence of how to reverse it. 
We've got no evidence of what to do here. And we need to think through how we the research that's needed to address these questions. And that's hard, as I'll point out in a moment. So what do we know? We know that epigenetics in some way, at least as it might explain the mechanism. This is old data, which was confirmed in other studies in Singapore and Gusto that showed that methylation in the umbilical cord blood of particular genes associated with insulin sensitivity correlate with children's fat mass in two different cohorts and re replicated once in one cohort six to nine years later. And, and that data has been replicated in multiple ways over time. We also know that those changes are influenced by mother's behavior, in this case, nutrition in early pregnancy. And we now have increasing data that maternal and paternal factors are arising before, even before conception can influence what happens. We also know that maternal diet and socioeconomic factors as here determined by educational achievement have a lot to do with, with with uh, influencing how the conditions of pregnancy goes. But to explain these multiple mechanisms, I think it's useful to take an evolutionary perspective. It's important in evolutionary biology to understand that selection does not work to promote health. Selection works to promote reproductive fitness, reproductive success. It's less concerned with health or longevity, particularly if that the health impacts are after peak reproduction. And peak reproduction in, in the evolutionary past was closer to 20 years to where, where most people, most families are now reproducing now. And so the core determinant from an evolutionary perspective of, rep, of Darwinian fitness is actually survival to young adulthood. And Evolutionary biology never leads to perfection. Evolutionary biology in, always involves trade-offs uh, as it and so selection drives the evolution of a beneficial trait until the point going any further would have a balance, but the marginal cost costs on other trades. And these trade-offs may be delayed or, or, or later. So what we know or, or, or early, the metabolic milieu acts on a susceptible individual. We know that. We know that if you're more susceptible to, to the impact of an obesogenic world, you're more likely to get type 2 diabetes and, and, and what follows, and the associates. We also know from the work that I've talked about and much other work that developmental influences acting in utero and during infancy, and much of this comes from gusto, Act, affect that susceptibility through epigenetics, neuroplasticity, and learned mechanisms. One of the areas that is very interesting uh, in the work of SICS is, of course, the work that Kerry and others are doing on the uh, on how eating behaviours are learned or, or evolve, and how those are intermediate on the way to childhood obesity. Many tissues may be involved. And the point I want to make out is the, 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 two, the two pathways involved include either operate through adaptive mechanisms, that is evolved mechanisms, what I call developmental mismatch, and they're using the mechanisms of, of developmental plasticity, where SISCS focuses so much, or through non-adaptive mechanisms, which operates through evolutionary mismatch. I'm going to very quickly through these concepts because I've written whole books on this topic. If you think about it, and we just focus first on developmental, on the adaptive mechanisms, what happens if the fetus or infant is exposed to environmental cues? It makes sense to have evolved mechanisms of developmental plasticity to adjust to those mechanisms so you're more likely to survive the adulthood and to reproduce. And we know that, and there's a lot of evidence for it, and we call this mechanism predictive adaptation. Developmental plasticity can only operate to a certain age, because as we get older, the ability to be plastic is more limited. And the point is we choose 
and predict an early life, the world we think we're going to grow up in and developmental plasticity using epigenetic and other mechanisms are just as a developmental plastic program or mechanisms to try and adjust the organism to the world as things it's going to live in. It's like waking up in the morning and trying to predict whether you're going to need sunglasses or an umbrella in the afternoon. And if you choose the wrong choice, then you're going to pay for it in terms of getting wet or sunburnt later in the afternoon. One of the best examples of this is a little vole that lives in Pennsylvania. And, in, and these voles have a, a born in a nest and they stay in the nest for many days after they're born, before they come out. And we know, and they, uh, if they're born in spring, they're born with a thin coat of hair because they will grow up and and the adults and reproduce during adult life and through through summer but if they're born in autumn they're born with a much thicker coat of hair because they're going to grow up and have to thrive in a wintry snowy environment over the next few months and we well know we now know that the choice of hair thickness is determined by melatonin signals across the mother uh, across the placenta telling the, the, the fetus whether it's going to be born into shortening or lengthening day length. So there's no advantage in having thick or thin fur when the animal is born because it's born into a nest which is thermogenically therm thermally stable. The advantage is 20, 25, 30 days later when the baby vole enters out of the nest into the real world for the first time. Do we have a human equivalent of this? Well, we might have. Terence Forrester, who we work with in SACS, and who worked in Jamaica and I, have been studying the two syndromes of infant malnutrition. These are children who present at about 12 months of age with very severe malnutrition. You will have seen pictures of both on television from famines in Syria, Ethiopia. And Kwashi Orkor, which is far more fatal, is a situation where the child presents with edema, uh, with a high likelihood of infection for its kills, but actually has quite large fat supplies on board when they die. They're unable to mobilize their, 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 their nutritional stores adequately when they face malnutrition. On the other side, the marasmics, who look very, very wasted when they come in, but have minimal other consequences, have a low rate of infections and a much lower mortality rate, cope, have mobilized their nutrients by showing this extreme wasting uh, uh, during the malnutrition. Now, for years, it was argued that one was protein malnutrition, the other was protein calorie malnutrition, but that's just not true. We showed in Jamaica that these occur in the same families, in the same villages, the same households. And we discovered, after going back over a thousand cases, that there was a very large difference in birth weight. Those who had marasmics were much more likely to be smaller. That is, they've also been malnourished in utero for a variety of reasons, compared to the Kwashi Orkorn necks, which were of normal size at birth. And we go on to study these survivors, and all of these were rescued uh, by a very brilliant nutritional service in Jamaica. Uh, we went on to chase these, these people as adults. We were able to show that even as young adults, the marasmics, those who had had prenatal malnutrition and were equipped, therefore, with a metabolic physiology allowing them to waste and mobilize nutrients and therefore survive, were more likely to develop type 2 diabetes as adults, whereas the Kwashi Orkors, who had not been pre-adapted to malnutrition, when they faced acute malnutrition, were less able to mobilize their nutrients, their metabolic pathways were less efficient, and they ended up uh, more likely to die, but they didn't develop um, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes as they grew older. Now, I focus so far on diabetes and heart disease and nutrition. 
But I want to put in one slide from Gusto, which I think is a circuit breaker. As I've said already, focusing on adult metabolic disease is not going to turn any policymaker on. But Michael Meany and his colleagues' work using the Gusto cohort is, in my mind, revolutionary. It may be the most important observation from a, from a policy point of view since David Barker's original work in 1987. In their studies in Gusto, they showed at 28 weeks of gestation, about 40% of the population had subclinical measures of depression and anxiety and or stress. And they've gone on to show in beautiful studies that these children have altered, the children when they're born from these pregnancies have altered limbic system neuroanatomy, altered electrophysiology, altered executive functions, that is how they control their attention, their mood, uh, their, their, particularly attention, I'll come back to in a moment, their, 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 the way their brains operate at the higher level of planning, of thinking ahead, of responding to others is impaired. They also showed, Evelyn Law in particular, uh, showed that the impact of low socioeconomic status on the offspring health is partially, but very significantly, mediated through this interaction. And I think we're beginning to see how this might occur mechanistically, although we've not proven it yet. Now, I want you to hold this in mind because this is very important. Is this an evolutionary mismatch? In other words, they've, uh, they've responded appropriately in utero to a signal saying they're going to be born into a very stressful world. And they turn out not to be born into as stressful a world as the mother saw it. And therefore, they've got inappropriate uh, uh, development of their, um, of their executive functions. Well, we can't prove that yet in humans. It's not easy to prove. Although we have some suspicions in the, uh, in the Jamaican data. But what we do know is from animal experiments, and particularly from studies of the relationship between predators and prey in the Arctic, that in fact, that's exactly what you would expect. That if you think you're gonna be born into a, into a stressful world, a shorter attention span to be wary of the risk of predators is more likely. So is what Michael studied here actually an echo of our evolutionary past of being where, having a shorter attention span in a more stressed world. That's speculative at the moment, but it's one that I'm very fond of. Now, on the other hand, what about the other pathway? The other pathway is what we see frequently. We see it with maternal di uh, di gestational diabetes, maternal obesity, and with breastfeeding, bottle feeding, sorry. All of these are not things we would have expected to see in our evolutionary past. And I think the same will be true about many of the uh, environmental toxins that increasingly the SICS group is studying as well. Why do I think gestational diabetes is like this? You can understand it when it comes, or maternal obesity. Certainly you can understand it if it came to an environmental toxin. Certainly you can understand it that we were never designed to be bottle fed cow's milk. We were designed to be fed, fed mother's milk from the breast. Well, it's because when we look at all the ways in which nutrients are um, regulated and crossing the placenta, glucose is the only nutrient that's not regulated. There's no constraints on its transport. The more glucose you pour into mother, the more it gets into the fetus. The more it gets into the fetus, the more the fetus grows. And we know that fetal macrosomia is fatal to both mother and child. And therefore, it's reasonable to think that in evolutionary terms, our species didn't face gestational diabetes in the ancient past, because if we had, we would have probably evolved a, uh, limits on glucose transport across the placenta. Secondly, it's fairly clear that maternal obesity in most cultures would have been relatively unusual. In fact, obesity in general was probably unusual, except in the most top of the most elites of primitive societies. 
and even now in some societies being obese is a status as a status symbol so we think that maternal obesity and gestational diabetes while they may invoke other mechanisms are fundamentally an e a, a evolutionary mismatch not a developmental mismatch where we weren't evolved our species wasn't evolved to deal with high levels of glucose during pregnancy just like we weren't evolved to have cow's milk as an infant just as we weren't evolved to deal with a number of toxins or air pollutants pollutants or, or nicotine or alcohol that our fetuses get exposed to so I could go on at length, but in the interest of time, I'm going to stop in about two minutes. These questions, this is all very well. The science is coming together. We know a lot more than we used to know, but there's lots of questions here, and some of them are listed on this slide. But the fundamental question remains, what do we do to, with this knowledge? How would we, and at what stage would we do, and what would we advise to the policymaker to do and i would argue that by focusing more on neurodevelopment on infant behavior on emotional development on ability to learn the work that sascs is giving so much more attention to now you grab the attention of the policymaker because that's within their time preference that's within their ability to see the impacts and clearly Singapore is already doing that because they've identified advancing human potential as a core policy decision. So what will shift the policymaker? First of all, getting alliances with other stakeholders, educationists, public health people, the other sectors, civil society, private sector where they see value, shifting the attention to shorter term outcomes. And that's why the eating behavior work of Kerry and Anna is so important. It's why the neurodevelopmental work of Evelyn, of Michael, of Sharong, and everybody else, Michelle and others involved, is so critical. Because that's where we will shift the policy agenda. But the problem we've got is, what, how do we intervene? Probably the inventions that we need are very nonspecific. They're probably about advising moderation and more th in all things for both the mother and father before they conceive and during pregnancy. Whereas policymakers love very specific interventions. And these are going to be very, and it's very hard at the moment beyond some sil silver bullet, which has not been found to know what that will be. And if we're going to deal with complex interventions in childhood or pregnancy, we need to to sell them into a much broader context than just brain development. It's about the family, it's about the mother, it's about bonding, it's about relationships, it's about learning, it's about physical health, allergy, and so forth. And that's again why SICS is so broad in its canvas of how it looks at child development. And then finally, if we need high quality trials, and we those complex intervention trials are very difficult to design and very difficult to manage, but it's what we need, not, uh, and, and that's very difficult. There are, of course, many more allies that we need to bring into the picture. And while I won't go into it now, at the global level, we need to think about the other movements who would understand this and engage with these issues better. I'll stop there uh, and just open it up for questions. Thank you, Sir Peter, for the very enlightening session. We'll now move on to the Q&A, which will be moderated by Dr. Clara Chong, Head of Admin and Scientific Affairs at SICS. Uh, you may type your questions using the Q&A function and you have the option of staying anonymous if you wish. Uh, Dr. Chong will read the questions out for Professor Sir Peter. Alternatively, tap plus one in the chat and we'll call on you to ask the question live. Uh, we'll do our best to ask him as many questions as we can, but due to time constraints, we apologize ahead if we are unable to get to your question. Uh, over to you, Clara. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Justina. Hi, Peter. Um, thanks for having the wonderful talk. Um, 
I'm not seeing the questions pop up. I'm not sure if it's just me, but uh, perhaps Peter, um, what do you think of the impact of uh, climate change in the next few decades about um, how we're growing and what that means for the, the I guess, population as a larger whole? Well, I think climate change is a real concern. I mean, it, well, beyond the fact that it's going to lead to a lot of displacement of people, sea level rise, a lot of other things. I, I mean, because I was talking to Johan Rockstrom earlier today, who's probably the guru of the climate change community. And he, like me, thinks that 1.5 is now an imagination. And we're, say, we're, we're looking quite clearly at two degrees, two degrees plus, uh, the window of opportunity for keeping at 1.5 has narrowed. And of course, Ukraine has probably quite disrupted for a number of years uh, the kind of international alliances that are needed at a number of levels. But if we talk more specifically about mothers and children, around the world, climate change is going to be very stressful. We know that. We know that there are going to be rich climate change refugees. There's going to be a lot of other pressures. Oh, there'll be a lot more extreme weather events. All of these create stresses. And Michael's already shown the impact of recurrent stress in pregnancy on, on the offspring. I think at a more immediate level, a generation much earlier than mine, we're seeing the rise of eco-anxiety in many young people. Many of those people will be par our parents-to-be, and that too will impact on the next generation. And I actually think there's a real risk of a, a feed forward mechanism over several generations of more and more anxiety in young people driving more and more impaired executive function development and offspring so that when those grow and become adults, they'll be less resilient to the stresses ahead. If you think about what determines your success in life, it's fundamentally about self-control and resilience, emotional resilience. You know, Jim Heckman, Nobel laureate, showed years ago that if you looked at high school graduates versus high school dropouts in the US, IQ didn't distinguish between them. They had the same distribution of IQs. The thing that was different between the two groups were their executive functions. We know those functions largely developed before birth in the first three or four years of life. Those, and Richie Poulton from Dunedin has shown absolutely that even small shifts in self-control at the age of two to three is associated with enormous lifelong gains in terms of earnings, relationship management, and so forth. And so climate change indirectly is going to put a lot of stresses on the beginning of life beyond the much broader stresses it will do to the economy, to, uh, to, to um, many people's lives and safety. Uh, and, you know, sadly, and that's a lot of my work I do at the International Science Council, is trying to think of ways to accelerate the policymakers making the choices and the community accepting those choices. And I emphasize that second part. Policymakers cannot move um, uh, beyond what the pu their publics accept. What kind of trade-off do you think need to be made, though, in this space? Sorry, you, talk, you, you talked about building resilience. You talked about, um, you know, the communities accepting some of these uh, uh, different choices. What do you think are some of the choices that may be made, actually, to address some of these concerns? Well, I think we're going to have to think very much about two, two controls. And I'm, here I'm not talking about Singapore because it's a, I'm talking globally, Clara. One is a true carbon tax, a global carbon tax of real significance, at least $100 a tonne. And secondly, secondly, land use needs to be regulated, and that's the hardest thing. We're seeing massive loss of, in your neighbourhood of rainforest. Uh, the Amazon's close to a tipping point. There are lots of issues here, but they boil down to to a lot of individual choices we can make or think we can make, but there's always, but it's not easy to make always about how we do, about how we choose to move around, et cetera, et cetera. How many times we get on an airplane, which is a particular <laughs> issue for me. Um, at one level, 
But at the macro level, it's going to be largely around financial incentives. And Nick Stern and his great report showed that that while that you know in the end is by investing in the, in climate change technologies and so forth. It's a positive benefit over time to societies. But in the short term, we need sticks. And the carbon tax is the only way to get there. But again, it would need to be global because otherwise we'll, we'll see all the games that avoid it. And sadly, at the moment, the chances of global, global agreement on anything are really put aside. I mean, I, we, you know, we're two and a half years, or two and a quarter years into the pandemic, and we cannot even get agreement on how to modify whether they have a new pandemic treaty, new pandemic instrument. The international health regulations are clearly not fit for, for something like um, uh, COVID. And yet it's a very slow process. It, it's unlikely that within the next two to three years, we will actually get an, an international instrument agreed uh, to manage zoonoses moving forward. Okay. And that's a much more acute existential issue than dealing with climate change. So I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but at the moment, Ukraine and what's around Ukraine is actually interfering very severely with the, with the progress on the sustainability agenda. Mm. And I imagine also in terms of logistics and supply chains, that's completely changing the way that we deal with a lot of... Uh, yeah, well, I mean... Stuff. Food security is now going to be a huge issue with Ukraine, which was one of the largest grain suppliers to, to countries in Africa and so forth. That's clearly totally disrupted now. So there's a whole lot of issues here we could talk about. Okay, thanks for that. Um, maybe if I bring that down a little bit to a less, you know, long-term dismal problem, how about more acute events such as, you know, the pandemic that you just talked about? One of the attendees brought up a question about, you know, disruptions from COVID. Do you think this, these have long-term well, health? there's at least one paper in press uh, showing that women who are pregnant during COVID are more likely to have children who have impaired executive function. I've only seen the paper as an unrefereed preprint, so I'm not sure how it stood the test of review, but it's something that I'm hoping that Michael might be able to look at in time in MAMS, because he has clearly women who were pregnant before and after COVID, as well as during COVID within that study, and he and Xiaoying may be able to look at that. Um, I think the question that is raised by somebody in the chat, uh, Vidya, yes. um, is an important one. Uh, I can't answer it directly. You answer it by anecdotes. But certainly if you talk to Zulfi Bhutta from Pakistan, one of the great experts at public health, global public health for children, he would point out that the burden on women in very underdeveloped places during pregnancy can be very high. They can be walking many miles to get water from the pump. They can be doing a lot of other things. And so I think there may be different stress ores, but, and it depends on the situation, but I think it needs to be studied in context. And I think it's very difficult. Um, I think the issues of GDM in, in the Western world are impacted by maternal age, but they're impacted by maternal weight gain. They're impacted by preconception, uh, uh, visceral fat, they're impacting a lot of things. And I think that it's easy to go down to a specific. Uh, I'm just reluctant to assign a particular factor rather than looking at the person as a whole. I think we're very good in physiology at coming down to individual factors. We're much less equipped to look holistically at the individual. And again, that's one of the things that I think Gusto, Espresso do is because of the model domains they bring to the picture, they give a much more holistic picture than most previous studies. Having said that, I think if I was doing it again, and maybe one day we will do it again, I would be, I would be adding a lot more in the, in, the, in the broader social context of individual families. And I'd certainly want the father 
more uh, a more formal study of the paternal factors because there's increasing evidence for paternal factors being important as well. Do you think our studies look enough at um, the second point that Vidya brings up, which is talking a little bit more about the links between temperament and personality and uh, uh, maternal stress or anxiety outcomes? Look, I think like everything, all emotions evolve as, as it's normal to be anxious, it's normally to be depressed after particular events. Sadness is one of the ways we communicate to other people that we are distressed and it's normal to be distressed. Good mental health is not not having emotions. Good mental health is managing our emotions and making sure they're appropriate. And that's what's emotional resilience, which is again, one of the executive functions is all about. There's been a lot of work talked about lately about whether the way child rearing is now developing makes it less likely that people are able to handle risk and stress because the max the one i mean people say there's nothing certain in life but death and taxes there's one other thing that's certain something will go wrong shit happens and i think what it happens many times in our lives uh particularly in research and therefore i think it's important to understand that we have to have the psychological me mechanisms to control our emotions but it's also critical as social animals that we can demonstrate our emotions, show that we are anxious or sad when it's appropriate to do so. Personality may have largely genetic characteristics, but also has family characteristics. The balance between them and the interaction with them is quite complex and quite, and, and, and quite debated. But what is certain is clear that children who are resilient because they've got good emotional psychological con uh, control of their emotions were more likely to have successful lives than those that don't. And again, these are the issues that matter. Now you ask about the policies in school. I think the evidence on executive function says we've got to start earlier than that. It probably starts in pregnancy. It certainly involves years three to five, I think we're going to see that it involves the years one to three, because the scaffolding of the brain that determines the shape of executive functions develops during that time. Now, obviously, we can do things in, in childhood to ameliorate and reduce, but it's not the same as building it right in the first place. For instance, we know, for instance, that games, that, uh, things like the good behavior games introduced in Baltimore reduce the risks of emotional distress in adolescence some 10 years later. So there are things that we can do. I'm not sure about mindfulness and meditation, uh, their particular toolkits, but certainly elements of them as a whole are important in young people in beginning to look at themselves, understand themselves, and understand their emotions. How they're taught I think the most important thing is build the scaffolding right, because if you build the scaffolding right, uh, then then they're better equipped to actually uh, manage the situations ahead. But certainly thinking about what can be done in the education system is a point of focus of a lot of people around the world. And quite frankly, I think the Doha community, as it's doing with in SICS, needs to get a lot closer to the educational community. To be truthful, the education committee and the health community around the world tend not, or the science community, health developmental science community, have tended not to be very close to each other. I so, think Peter, on that one, that's, that's really true. I'm sorry, just in the interest of time, I'm also wondering if you could speak to Adrian Sandler's question there, which is talking then about, you know, that partnership between the research and the, um, and, you know, the education community or, or other sectors there. Can you whether in the Singapore context or something else, what are some policy successes in, in this early child health space and um, how did that triangulation come about? What, what, how do we stage that? If well, I think the most important obvious thing was the, the most obvious demonstration. I think there's many more, but the most obvious demonstration was the, the, the death, finding the finding that the diagnostic basis for gestational diabetes in Singapore 
was not the same as that used around the world, uh, in the Western world or the, the European world, and therefore making the case that all women should be screened, not just a subset of women. And of course, because of the close communication between SASES, Ministry of Health, a lot of communication that ultimately ended up being developed into public policy. I think the same things as happening around maternal mental health. Uh, last year, I had lengthy meetings with the uh, with senior officials, and I know Yap Singh and others continue on the importance of mental health and pregnancy. And I think the next step is how do we actually intervene to help women who are stressed in pregnancy? Because I think with Michael's readouts, we can now do that with early in life with very with a fair degree of precision. I think that some of the things that we're doing with Anne Rifkin or planning to do with Anne Rifkin from NIE on uh, uh, on uh, interventions in the first year, in the first and second year of life, simple parental interventions make a lot of sense. I think the work that uh, Ev Evelyn Law has done on the relationship between screen time and uh, and the development of executive functions has critical importance and needs to be followed up in different ways. But understanding the impact of passive screen time on children comes out of the Gusto study and I think has a major public health implications in Singapore. So I think, I think there's many things, some are big, some are small, but they add up to why SICS is a pathfinder for the kind of studies that will lead Singapore to do better by the next generation. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, perhaps, you know, you mentioned that a lot of this uh, studies that you mentioned or even the interventions might not be that um, well prescribed. Are there any kind of um, thoughts about the, the relevance of perhaps uh, better marketing or scientific communications alongside that to, to share some of these? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I often get asked on radio or in the press, what do I re recommend for a woman who's going to get pregnant? And I, I, you know, what should they eat? What should they do? You know, there's all these myths about what you should eat this or not eat that. I mean, some of them are important, but most of them are fairly mythological. And I say, have a boring life. Don't do anything. Eat, eat, not, you know, the, the argument is extremes of things that are under or over that we're not designed for. So we want a balanced diet. It can be balanced in many different ways. We want a, a reasonable but not excessive or insufficient weight gain during pregnancy. When I first came to Singapore in the 1990s, I think it was, or no, 2000s, I was shocked to find there was people arguing that women should diet in pregnancy, because if you dieted in pregnancy, you would have a better body shape after pregnancy. And we know from the work done in Japan that dieting in pregnancy, and they were taking pills to actually to encourage weight loss in pregnancy. Now, I mean, that's just, for, these are not women who are obese. These were normal uh, women of normal body mass index. This is dangerous stuff to do. Life, we evolved to have a fairly uh, not, not extreme exposures. And I think that's, that's the problem. How do you explain that to people? It's like we find in New Zealand that with all the publicity we do, still have, a number of women still drink alcohol in pregnancy when it's quite clear that they shouldn't. I mean, it's all these sorts of things are hard and confusing messages. And one of the problems is I think you've got to go back a step. And I, I can't comment on Singapore because I do not know enough about Singapore education. But people like Jackie Bay in New Zealand and, and Mark Hansen in, 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 in Southampton has shown quite clearly that you can change understandings of these issues quite a lot by good science education in adolescence. Now, whether, certainly it changes the understanding. Whether it actually changes their behavior is not yet known. But I think that science education, at least in my country, tends to focus on earthworms, dogfish, 
other animals, it tends not to focus on the one animal they need to know a lot about, which is the human animal. And I think that we need, I mean, if we're going to get better at public health messaging, which is what we're really talking about here, you need the people to have that basic health literacy evolving, not because experts are telling them to do so, but because they've grown up and been educated in the one machine they have the absolute responsibility to drive, that's their own body. And we've seen that in drug education not an issue for Singapore, uh, you're lucky. But we've seen that education about drug use, which is based on thou shalt not take drugs, does not work. Whereas education that says, this is how the brain cells talk to each other. And this is what chemicals do to those talking and what those consequences are, does work. And so that education and public health are far more linked than we give credit to. And I think governments have been slow around the world because I think health education at school is all about sex education, how, et cetera, et cetera, and not recognizing that science is, uh, that biology should be talk around, taught around the human being. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, well, on that aspect, you know, you talked a little bit about developmental um, and evolutionary mismatch. Do you think this applies to the wider sort of uh, aspect of human capital, especially since we now have longer lifespans and our perhaps uh, you no know, version of success is not necessarily just reproductive success alone, but just a uh, long term economic value of human beings? Well, I'm always I'm always skeptical about, and I mean, it has a bad history of evolutionary but economics, ev evolutionary sociology, but I don't think we need to go there. I mean, time preferences matter and people, and there are cultures in which intergenerational uh, passage is critically important to them. I lived with the Maori culture in New Zealand where they don't think as much about the health of the individual as they think about the health of the lineage. And of course, the current, the, the most popular version of, of, of the explanation for why humans evolved to have the menopause, which is very rare in non-human species, the pilot whale is perhaps the only unequivocal un other example, is because we think that it evolved because the grandmother became a key poor person in helping the mother and the new infant thrive and survive in difficult conditions. And there's a fair bit of evolution of empirical support for various versions of what's called the grandmother hypothesis for longevity. There's always been a subset of humans that have lived long lives. I mean, uh, yet while the average life span has more than doubled in the last century, uh, the average lifespan uh, in the French Revolution was only about 35 years. It's now somewhat lot larger than that, uh, unless you're a young soldier in the Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> and, sorry. Um, yeah, it's not funny. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. Um, and so there are things happening which we've not been exposed for. And of course, Alzheimer's disease, sarcopenia, all those things are relatively new phenomenon because we, we, on average, other than a minority of people, very few people live that long. So if you think about the, why the age of retirement is largely about 65 in a pension schemes, it was because when they were first developed, the average lifespan was only 67 years so that the actuaries could, could see how pensions could be afforded. Now, of course, it's over 80 years, and yet the retirement stays at 65, except for me. Um, and so I think there are issues to understand about living long. They, it is, in a sense, something that I don't think I want to spend too much time putting an evolutionary argument on it, other than to say our species was not designed uh, to imagine that the bulk of us would live so long. Mm -hmm. and that our reproductive 
Uh, I mean, because if you think about it in reproductive terms, you might argue that it made more sense that women didn't, if we were living a much longer life, you wouldn't expect the menopause as early as we have it now. Mm -hmm. Menopause used to be somewhat younger. It's got a bit later as, uh, as nutrition has improved. And there's some evidence that under great stress, menopause occurs earlier. There are genes that control the age of menopause, so it is a selected process. Um, uh, but uh, I think, you know, we're dealing with a, with a very new phenomenon, a very, very new phenomenon of a significant percentage of any population reasonably expecting to live, well, the kids who are born today in Singapore or New Zealand or Japan have a pretty high chance of living into the 22nd century. It's a, it's a rather interesting thought. You've just had a, a baby. She, he, she will live probably into the 22nd century. Yeah, that's, that's mind-boggling to think of, but it's probably true. Um, I think we'll just take uh, one or two more short questions uh, from the audience here. Someone mentioned um, about uh, an upcoming regulation that Singapore has to allow social aid freezing. Do you think that has an impact on health outcomes uh, of the community or at the individual level? Say that question again. What was the beginning um, of the question? So the, the specific question was, will the upcoming regulation to allow women to freeze their eggs uh, affect pregnancy or health outcomes in Singaporeans? Well, there's a little bit of data and it's very mixed data on the impact of various forms of IVF uh, and assisted reproductive technologies on long-term outcome. Some show a somewhat deleterious effect, others don't show any evidence of a deleterious effect. Clearly the details of the, pro of the process probably make a huge difference. And it's a bit more complicated because women who, uh, we discovered in New Zealand in a study that we did a number of years ago, that women undergoing IVF were spending more on nutritional supplements than they were spending on the IVF itself. So the understanding the whole milieu of that period, conceptual period is difficult. To my knowledge, there's no compelling evidence of adverse effects of freezing eggs, but how, how, how much data there is, I'm not so sure. More importantly, however, it continues to reflect the delaying reproductive behavior of humans. You know, we've seen basically an increase by a decade in peak reproduction age. So women and, women and men are both trying to get pregnant at a later, well, the men aren't trying to get pregnant, but they're involved in getting pregnant at a, at a later day, at a later age. There are impacts of that. We do know that maternal age and paternal age have impacts. Uh, how important they will be in the presence of good antenatal screening to remove Down syndrome from the list is yet to be determined. But sociologically, one needs to think it, there's a lot to learn, and I'm not an expert on it. But, you know, as people age, we're seeing women in their 40s and 50s having their first, 40s having their first child. Think about that in intergenerational terms. And thinking about, and there's, you know, there's a lot here to understand. I'm not making a judgment because it's what's happening all around the world. But we need to just understand that none of these have things have effects in isolation. There will be spillover effects that we probably don't understand yet of changing uh, the way we reproduce and delaying how, as in many countries, the number of women who are using assisted techniques is rising to be very high. Okay, thank you, Peter. I think that was really insightful. I think there's a lot of uh, different bits that we can each chew on and perhaps we weren't able to answer everyone's uh, specific questions. Uh, there is probably a lot more information from whether the work's done that by at SICS or with Michael Meany and uh, Johan Eriksson as well, but feel free to, to reach out to, to Peter or anyone else uh, from SICS uh, and we can help you with uh, addressing some of these queries. Thanks very much, Peter. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Peter. We hope that you found this webinar interesting and insightful. Um,
we will share the link to the recording with all of you soon, uh, which will be made uh, av available for a limited period. And we'll be having another session of the SICS Seminars Human Potential Series next month. So keep a look out for our EDM or follow SICS on LinkedIn for updates. Take care, stay safe, and thank you for joining us.